Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you to our large audience here at the Quick Center. Um, I'm Carrie Weber. I'm the executive director of the Fairfield University Art Museum, and thank you all for braving this horrible weather to join us here live. Um, we have a nice audience uh, watching from the comfort of their warm homes, but I really appreciate those of you who um, made it to the Quick Center to be with us in person, uh, and I'm sure our speaker appreciates it very much that there are some bodies in the room. Um, we will get to our talk with Alima Taha, our guest curator of our exhibition, Adra Cowan's Sense and Sensibility, in just a few minutes. Um, the exhibition is on view in the Bellarmine Hall galleries. If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you will. It's fantastic, stunningly beautiful. It's on view until June 18th, so it'll be there all semester. Please come and see it. Um, as you know, Ms. Taha is going to be speaking about collecting black visual culture and the art market. Um, we, are, we are really delighted to have her uh, with us. Before she comes out, I just would like to say a few words and, and share a couple of announcements. Um, as some of you may know, the museum created a black art fund a year ago uh, during Black History Month, so last February, when we sadly came to the uh, realization that our permanent collection the artwork that is always accessible for the academic and public mission of our museum, um, it's on our database, on view. Um, it did not contain uh, a single uh, work by a black artist. Um, this is a pretty shocking um, realization. Um, the collection is relatively small. The museum is relatively new, um, but this is not an excuse. Um, Almost every artwork in the collection um, was received as a donation. Again, this is not an excuse. Our acquisition, acquisitions budget is virtually zero. Again, not an excuse. These institutional limitations um, are real. They exist, but um, not acceptable excuses. So with this realization, we became committed to proactively making a change for greater representation and recognition of black artists and artwork in our collection. And we've raised $30,000 for the fund to date, which is about halfway to our goal of $60,000. We've purchased uh, two artworks, a ceramic cup entitled Peaceful Protesters to Nina Simone by the Afro-Latino artist Roberto Lugo, whose work we showed this past fall, and a sculpture by Roberto Visani entitled Cardboard Slave Kit, Abolitionist Blend DIY, and we've received two gifts of artwork um, by black artists, a print by Sam Gilliam and a painting by Anthony Titus. So we are, we're on our way, we're, we're educating ourselves. and one of the reasons we asked uh, Halima Taha here tonight, um, knowing that she was an expert in this field was quite, quite selfish. We, we wanted to um, hear her speak on this topic that she is an expert on to help us um, learn from her expertise as we continue on this journey of, of purchasing works by black artists for our collection. We know the museum needs to be self-critical and transparent about the actions that we take to make anti-racist change happen in our small corner of the world. And we believe this important work towards diversifying our collections will make the conversations associated with the artworks richer, more diverse, more inclusive, and more representative of the communities we serve, live in, and aspire to build. My colleagues and I at the museum believe that museums are not neutral and truly can be agents of change. We also believe that black lives matter, black artists matter, and black art matters. So with that, I would very much like to thank the Fairfield University Black Student Union for co-sponsoring tonight's event. And I'd also like to thank Connecticut Humanities for the recent Cultural Fund Grant Award, which is allowing us to live stream and record this event. So now I'd very briefly like to share some exciting upcoming programs. Um, for more relating to the Adger Cowens exhibition, the next program um, was supposed to be on March 30th. We were really excited. It was postponed from opening night. Um, MacArthur Genius Award winner Deb Willis, uh, artist and scholar, um, is 
supposed to come and be in conversation with her dear friend, Adra Cowens, and Halima Taha, um, that has been postponed again, and it is being rescheduled, fingers crossed. It looks like it's gonna be April 13th, 13th now, but stay tuned, because that has not been confirmed. So I just wanted to, if any of you were counting on that, please um, stay tuned. Um, but um, on April 20th, um, Adra Cowens will be in conversation with photographer Larry Silver, whose work is opening in the Walsh Gallery here on March 24th. So please come to that opening uh, exhibition. There'll be a lecture here that evening with his curator, Leslie K. Brown, talking about his work. Um, the exhibition's entitled 13 Ways of Looking at Landscape, Larry Silver's Connecticut Photographs. And um, then on the 20th, Adger and Larry will be in conversation um, with their two curators. And um, we're really looking forward to that. Um, they have both been um, practicing their art for a very long time, and I think they will have a lot to talk about, their teachers, their mentors, their influences, um, both in New York and Connecticut, um, and, uh, and much more. So all of these programs will be presented in person, but they will also be live streamed, so if you are in our uh, virtual audience, you will be able to also enjoy those virtually, and they will be recorded and can be viewed on our YouTube channel. Okay, now, the main event. For no fur without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Halima Taha is recognized as an art professional who has contributed to the field as a curator, appraiser, art advisor, educator, and speaker for more than 20 years. She is best known for her groundbreaking bestseller, Collecting African American Art, Works on Paper and Canvas, the first book to validate collecting fine art, printmaking, and photography by Americans of African descent as viable assets and commodities within the marketplace. It was also used as a choice PBS membership in incentive, raising three times its fundraising goal. Since its release, this title provided solid market criteria for publishers to print more art artist monographs and African American art collection books, independent from museum shows within the first two decades of the 21st century. In addition, her expertise provided the foundation in conjunction with the National Black Fine Art Show in 1997 to 2009 for cultivating and educating a global audience that enabled Swan Galleries to successfully establish the first international African-American auction category in 2008. Her work was also the catalyst for ushering major museums to actively pursue collections of African-American art for exhibition and acquisition within the first two decades of this century. She is an arts advocate committed to nurturing the development documentation and acquisition of black visual culture as a professional speaker and arts writer. Please welcome Halima Taha. Good evening. It's always so good to see new and familiar faces together in pursuit of increasing our knowledge about ourselves and the world in which we live in through art. I'm happy to see all of you here, and I am happy to feel everyone in the virtual space. I'm glad that you are um, watching as we are so fortunate to be able to stream this um, presentation. I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank um, Carrie Weber of the Fairfield Muse University Museum and uh, Dr. Michelle uh, DiMarzo, Curator of Education and Academic Engagement, and again, the Black Student Union of Fairfield University uh, for inviting me to contribute to their program in conjunction uh, with the Adra Cowan Sense and Sensibility Exhibition. Uh, and last but not least, I must uh, thank Joe Salata and Russ Nagy um, for making it possible to have all of the technical um, benefits of their expertise for the streaming and for the presentation here um, at the Quick, as a part of the Quick Center team. My intention today is to shed light on why and how the market for African American art has developed so rapidly within the last 20 years and to provide some tips on collecting black visual culture. First, it's important to note that the appetite for fine art by artists of African descent 
didn't come from nowhere. In recent history, we can look at the earliest part of the 20th century during the Harlem Renaissance when philosopher and cultural arbiter Dr. Alain Locke encouraged black artists to draw upon their African heritage for inspiration. A young artist was inspired by the artists of the Harlem Renaissance, and he didn't understand why black artists were not receiving critical acclaim or reviews from critics. And when he inquired, he was told that black people were not in this country long enough for them to have a history. The an this answer was the catalyst for James Porter to establish the field of African American art history with his 1943 book, Modern Negro Art, which was actually his master's thesis at New York University. This is the beginning of a tradition of necessity that created and elevated the field of African American art and history to where it is today. 33 years later, his student and mentee, David C. Driscoll, curated and wrote the exhibition catalog for the two centuries of black American art in 1976, which reinforced Porter's book and work that black artists have a history, but not only do they have a history, we've been in this country for 200 years. And this exhibition traveled all over the world and abroad, raising the awareness about black American artists. And in 1978, Dr. Samela Lewis wrote Art African American, which was the first art history book about black artists written by the first African American to earn a PhD in art history. So she provided the final cornerstone in this field. Throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, there has been a steady growth of trailblazing efforts of cultural workers, artists, collectors, and families who built organizations to nurture the development of black visual culture. In Philadelphia, there's Alan Edmonds, Brandywine Workshop, Barbara Wallace, Sandy Webster's Gallery, to name a few. In New York, there was Kinkeleva House, just above Midtown, dealers Peg Alston, June Kelly, Eric Robertson, and the Savaku Gallery, and, and the Fourth Street Photo Gallery, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and Gramercy Park's Onyx Art Gallery. In Washington, D.C., Evangeline Montgomery was critical to exposing the world to American artists of African descent through the United States Embassies program. During the 1980s, the majority of people who were purchasing abstract work by American artists of African descent, they were primarily European collectors collecting German expressionism and Japanese investors working, uh, you know, working together with curators um, and in the 80s, they were actually buying a lot of different things. But working class and middle class black people, as well as white American collectors, were interested in integrating their collections not with black artists, but with strong art by American artists that complemented geographic and aesthetic themes in their existing collections. By the 1990s, there were 45 black owned and only 20 white-owned galleries representing African-American artists. By 1997, Jocelyn Wainwright created the National Black Fine Arts Show, which was an incredible fair in the sense that under one roof, artists and galleries from all over the United States and a few from abroad were presenting work by artists that were local, regional, national, international, and uh, it was a very exciting, vibrant environment to be in. And, um, and at the time, many of the critics of the show uh, panned it. Um, they, they didn't, you know, they, uh, they perpetuated um, a lot of misconceptions about the caliber of the work, the quality of the artists and their ideas. And many of those same critics today are now um, celebrating uh, the shift in the marketplace. And we'll talk a little bit about why that perception of being devalued existed. Uh, following the show, um, a year later, um, Collecting African American Artworks on Paper and Canvas was published, and, um, and, it be and it was the first book to validate collecting works on paper, canvas, and printmaking, and photography um, as viable assets and commodities. And, um, 
And it, it, together with the National Black Fine Arts Show, they cultivated and educated the market for Swan to develop the first African American auction category. The questions I would like to explore include what enables the cultural production of artists of African descent to ascend into value be beyond its immediate community? Why has the market increased its interest in these artists at this time in history as opposed to previous decades and centuries? How is the historic perception of worth directly linked to the economic benefits of American slavery and the prevailing post-colonial perceptions of people of color and their value. Within the art market, we have all heard the terms African-American, black, Americans of African descent interchangeably because the expression of ethnic identity has been an American trope since the 19th century when Im immigrant groups began competition for recognition and respect. It was not until the New Deal in the 1930s that women and artists of color participated in greater numbers in shaping and reflecting American cultural identity in public spheres. Like and like and through the WPA. The civil rights movement fortified this trend and by the end of the 20th century, it was solidified. Therefore, I am not defining ethnicity. Instead, I am focusing on the interrelated experiences and relationships among black American artists with collectors, dealers, curators, appraisers, critics, and academia and how these overlapping and interdisciplinary relationships have shared collecting power and value within the marketplace. Independent to th this infrastructure, black artists create their work for themselves and for, sh and, sh and for strangers, for others to examine, to reflect upon, and to respond to. So why has it taken until the 21st century for meritorious work by American artists of African descent to be noticed and valued? The short answer is that the art world has been conditioned to the impossibility that people of African descent are capable of making fine art because art is about ideas. And major collectors of American art are filling their historic and aesthetic gaps in their collections with one of the most untapped bodies of American art. If they have a Jackson Pollock and a Helen Frankenthaler, they need a Norman Lewis, a Hale Woodruff, a William T. Williams, a Mary Lovelace O'Neill, a Mildred Thompson, and an Alma Thomas. The other reason is scholarship. It has taken 40 years for there to be a substantial body of historical literature about African American artists, their lives, and the context for the work that they create. Why has this taken so long? The range of aesthetic traditions and influences affirm that black people and their art are not monolithic, contrary to the derogatory projections of early critics. For example, the gaps in the market perceptions of value perpetuate the schism that people of African descent are intellectually inferior and subhuman, thereby having limited value. For example, in 1897, the New York Herald stated that the Negro seems to have an appreciation for art while being manifestly unable to produce it. This statement of ability influenced the perception of worth, of, of worthlessness um, of black artists to systematically marginalize and diminish the social economic value of African American cultural production in, in art. And in the 1980s, African American artists would go to 57th Street galleries and so Soho galleries. Uh, this is before Chelsea, which exists now. Um, and before showing their work um, and extending an invitation for a studio visit, they would be told, we don't show black art, as soon as they walked in. I bore witness to this. I knew many of the artists that went through this. And the reason black artists were not taken seriously despite their training or the quality of their work was because of this rationale, rationale for enslaving Africans, which was based on the view that black people were less than, they were unintelligent, subhuman, unable to care for themselves, only good for breeding and labor. These ideas ha continue today. And, these derog and then 
On top of that, there were the derogatory images from the 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation, and New York actor Thomas Rice's creation of the stereotyped Jim Crow character in which he wore burnt cork to create the first blackface minstrelsy. And this has contributed cumulatively to the degradation in, of black people and into invisibility and seriousness uh, and lack of t taking black artists seriously. In Ralph Ellison's words, he aptly describes the experience that I'm describing. I am invisible. Understand, simply because people refuse to see me, like the bodiless heads you see, sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, destroying glass. When they approach me, they see only my surrounding, themselves or figments of their imagination indeed, everything and anything except me. Inasmuch as many of these negative and stereotypical views of black people remain prevalent, artists of African descent continue to produce some of the most compelling and thought-provoking work in the world. And this, if you look at it, is an act of resistance to remain true to themselves with the experiential knowledge that they are not less than anyone. So I want to talk a little bit about the marketplace um, uh, because I think it's important to understand how the marketplace works. Um, it, you know, the short of it is that it's a series of interrelated symbiotic relationships. Um, but there are distinctions and they do overlap. So some of us are familiar with the many roles within the art world. But to clarify, the art world is based on a series of symbiotic relationships that are collectively responsible for propelling artists into the marketplace. Here we have art worlds. And within each category of artists and collectors and dealers and art advisors and art consultants and curators and auction houses and academia and appraisers and critics, there are worlds within those worlds. Um, but if, let's just talk about the artists. Today, artists of African descent are producing work that offers new ways of thinking about contemporary themes by addressing issues of gender, sex, sexuality, immigration and trade, identity and beauty, politics and race, social justice and technology. Their work is relevant to global audiences in this century and beyond. Today and throughout the history of African American art, artists continue to produce some of the most challenging work of our time. Within the last 25 years, African American art has become the most actively sought work by private and institutional collections worldwide. Major collectors are recognizing the historic and aesthetic gaps in their American art collections, and African American artists are combining a rich and diverse blend of aesthetic traditions from Africa, Asia, Europe, the Caribbean, North, South, and Central America. Consequently, they're attracting an international audience of collectors to a varied aesthetic with a historic precedent since 1793. It has taken 229 years for the market to confirm that African American art is aesthetically and historically relevant, and it's a worthy asset and commodity. It is clear that the dissemination of culture in the United States is stacked through its commerce, resulting in being coveted and taken more seriously because of economic gain. This is exactly what is happening to the work of African American artists in the market. I would like to point out, though, that most artists, they want to be recognized for their talent and as American artists, and whose ethnic identity is neither a detriment or an asset. It's about the work and the linear or organic aesthetic pedigree within the history of art for many of these artists. Now, the collectors in this art world, they're, they're not an indistinguishable group. Some are merely decorating for their office and homes. Some of them are buying art for pure investment, like stocks. Others are passionate about art and history and enjoy the experience of the research and discovery of, of uh, whatever their passion is. But there are serious collectors who flourish because of the social intellectual activity that surrounds collecting. Others are addicted to the acquisition of visual ideas. 
There are also collectors who want to follow the legacy of the 15th century Italian Medici family by commissioning artists for a range of interdisciplinary art that include architecture, public and private residencies, and fellowship programs. And perhaps the most public African-American art collector following this tract is Pamela Joyner. She is an example of a collector who supports artists of interest simultaneous to, presenting, uh, to providing residencies for them. She also supports museums in their acquisitions and recently donated millions of dollars for the African American Art History Initiative at the Getty. Overall, collectors can be motivated by passion, money, cultural needs, or leisure. Dealers are generally the middle person between the artist and the private or institutional collector. Some have brick and mortar galleries and participate in art fairs. Others only exhibit and sell at art fairs. Some work by appointment only. They usually have a group of artists that represent their view of an aesthetic or historic period that is important to them. They build relationships with collectors and museums to sell work, and they also buy art from auctions, private families, other dealers, collectors, and some artists to sell and place in collections. Art advisors and art consultants do similar work as private curators for collectors or advise on the acquisition of particular works that they get directly from the artists, dealers, or collectors who are deaccessioning their collections. Sometimes the scope of work includes collection management and acquisition responsibilities. The difference between the two is how they are compensated for their professional services. Curators in the museum, and the broadest definition it would be that a curator is a person who is the selector and interpreter of works of art for exhibition. This role also includes the responsibility of a producer, an educator, a manager, exhibition planner, organizer, and in this context, many dealers assume, many dealers also assume these roles. Curators also assert their intellectual prowess with the ideas defined and created by artists. Now, ironically, the word curator first emerged in the mid-14th century, meaning overseer manager or guardian. And it comes from the Latin word curar, curar um, meaning to take care of. The part <laughs> that tickles me is that it was originally used to describe those who oversaw minors and lunatics. <laughs> so I will leave you to reflect upon that and some of the more colorful days many of us have experienced with artists and creatives and other people in our lives. <laughs> Um, the evolution of this role, though, is directly linked to the development of collecting for the wealthy. And curating was once an activity limited to professionals working in museums who were concerned with the preservation of collections and staging exhibitions. The term is no longer limited to museums or exhibitions, but instead includes all sorts of programming in any venue. Perhaps one of the best contemporary definitions by Australian art historian Terry Smith is, curating is caring for the culture, above all enabling its artistic and creative transformers to pursue their work. This facilitation is done preferably with empathy, insight, effectively with some style. Auction houses are companies that facilitate buying and selling assets, including fine art, collectibles, and antiques. Historically, the auction market was somewhat of a wholesale market where dealers secured work and resold with a significant markup. In the late 1980s and 1990s, savvy collectors of African American art would go to auctions and buy work for hundreds and a few thousand dollars. Now many of those works are worth six figures or more and have priced out early collectors from the auction arena. Um, the, the, the first time the idea that black people could afford to buy a piece of art at auction was when the Cosby family went to buy an Ellis Wilson painting in 1984 um, at an auction house. And prior to that episode, that image never existed in the pantheon of possibilities for black Americans when it came to art. Not from their perspective, but from the rest of the country's perspective or the rest of the world's perspective. In a subtle way, it brought attention to the fact that black artists were good enough to have work at an auction house. 
The best thing about Swan Galleries is that there are 15 years of consistent auction prices for African American artists. This is very important from an appraisal perspective because prior to that, when you would do your economic uh, comparable analysis and you have to include researching auction prices, what dealers are selling the works for, um, comparing it to um, uh, artists, uh, um, their sales receipts and everything, what was going on in the market was not necessarily paralleling what was happening at auction for a lot of the African American artists. Um, so often the uh, market itself had much higher prices because that was where the real value and where the transactions were taking place. Prior to 2007, a great deal of work came to auction, but they were not commanding the high prices because people didn't know about these artists. And the sales were, at, the artists, the sales um, were very low, and there was little scholarship for the auction houses to use as references. The perverse irony is that black bodies used to be sold, labeled, number, numbered, and displayed as a lot for sale at sev several of the same auction houses that currently are selling fine art by American artists of African descent. And today, the intellectual property and cultural materialism of black artists is commanding more at auction than when black people were auctioned as physical property. Total auction sales between 2008, uh, 2008 and 2018 uh, is $460.8 million. Um, now, with regard to academia and scholarship, and I'm going through all of these because it's really important to understand that there are many, many tentacles and variables that propel an artist into the marketplace. Um, and it's important because a lot of times, many of us know very talented artists and may say, my goodness, this person is so talented. I don't understand why nobody, you know, they're not, this work isn't in the museum or it's not in an auction. But it's this collective activity that is essential um, from a market perspective in, in propelling an artist into the marketplace. Academia and scholarship is extremely important because it contributes to, significantly to visual literacy. This is important in a world where we are encountering and consuming images at a rapidly increasing rate, so we must be able to read what we see to be able to decode it. The study of the history of art is not just the study of history, but an interdisciplinary study of aesthetics, culture, ideas, language, and humanity. Collectors are simultaneously becoming bibliophiles as they build their collections, and art dealers need scholarship to substantiate and contextualize art within the art historical canon. Appraisers are providing a comparable economic analysis of the market based on the information gleaned from the galleries, the auction records, and studio sales receipts. Prior to the recent consistency of auction records, appraising African American art was a challenge based on the USPAP Uniform Standards Professional Appraisal Practice, which is an appraisal methodology which requires the use of comparable prices of similar work in style, size, and medium from auction results. And because there were inconsistent and few auction values prior to the last 15 years, the only true values between 1984 to 2007 came from art dealers who were selling the work. And most appraisers specializing in American art didn't know anything about African American art or its history. And many are still clueless within the market, resulting in lesser numerical values. Critics are important because they provide discussion and historic interpretation of art and its value in pursuit of a rational basis for art appreciation. Interpretive um, analyses and aesthetic judgments dominate the discourse of art criticism. The criticism has an important role in developing and deepening the work of artists, but also helps viewers perceive and interpret art. Currently, there is a crisis in criticism because many critics have become PR agents for contemporary galleries, and the art market, thereby, becoming an integral part of the contemporary art machinery, whose main aim is, of course, to sell work and just make money. So rather than, cri rather than crisis and criticism, it appears as if there is a crisis 
of relative values that could be treated with criticism. And without criticism, the only measure of value in art becomes money, a measure both fickle and, and uh, saltifying. So let's talk about the um, current market and why African diasporic art is hot, 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 hot right now in the market. These variables contribute to it, getting it to a certain point. So the, the very curatorial themes, uh, what's going on in Africa, Europe, the United States, globalism, transnationalism, and the internet are of huge variables that have impacted the market combined with the collective activity of art professionals in the art market and the art world that I just described. Currently, the market's mercurial embrace of African American art reflects an attraction to and awe with its unique blend of African, Asian, European, uh, Caribbean, North, South, and Central American influences. The issue is not how the works of African American artists compare to their European peers, but to what extent it shows the artist's ability to make visual statements that viewers, regardless of their background, can relate. Collectively, the work of African American artists is not confined to one style or influence. These artists are no different than any other artists engaged in the creative struggle to express an individual sensibility while simultaneously relating to the historical and cultural rhythms of time and place. Critical attention has positioned the work of black artists among the most actively purchased and still affordable American art because of its conceptual and aesthetic spheres of interest. Now, in Africa, What's going on there that's affecting the market is that African cities are expanding their focus on urbanity, democracy, and political stability. Now there are new museums, there are more temporary platforms, and galleries have flourished in South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and Morocco, to name a few. Additional variables include a sense of freedom of expression, creative economies are expanding, decolonization, and educated exiles are returning home with economic prosperity resulting in the rise of a new middle class that is actually collecting. Europe is confronting colonial history through African art and dealing with guilt, right-wing politics, and a crisis with ethnographic collections. In the United States, Black Lives Matter movement, woke culture, and the rise of renewed black consciousness, a, con a crisis currently in museology that drives to diversify museum collections and staff, right-wing politics, there's deaccessioning of white male masterworks, and then there's the scramble to buy art produced by black artists. The global shifts um, have to do with the imp impact with the fixation with co contemporary art museums and the market and the rise of a creative economy. And art has become an asset class. The result of this heightened interest in contemporary art at auctions is that 19th century and old masterworks represent a smaller segment market. Globalization reflects the transnationalism explosion of biennales and art fairs that are being used in marketing cities, and it's a strategy to address economic and political issues in those locations. Globalization has increased travel to work, exposing people to cultures other than their own. Art is linked to this biennial boom that took place in the late 1980s and 90s, which established the, it, the idea of international exhibitions with art from around the world through globalism. And there is an increase, as a result, there's an increase under, uh, uh, experience of borderlessness. 
Transnationalism is the result of people leaving their countries of origin, settling and working between multiple cities. People are developing multiple identities, allegiances, knowledge, and connectedness to different countries and cities. The globalization of art automatically demands artists to become transnational beings. This becomes the substance of their work and at times challenges the idea of monolithic identities which are a result of historical prejudice. The internet's social media platforms make exposure to art possible without travel, and people are watching us today. <laughs> so you know, it, it's, it makes exposure to art and ideas um, possible without travel because it is visually driven, and, this, and it spreads ideas about social and political movements that implode or advance racism, feminism, the LGBTQIA rights, and. And all of these things are connected to ideas and collecting interests expressed in art. The immersion in virtual worlds increases the drive for real experiences and value for things that cannot be digitally generated. So the curatorial themes worldwide that have to do with black visual culture um, include uh, identity, fashioning of new, new subjectivities, um, colonial legacies, social issues, geography, space and place, black consciousness, post-independence, democracy, attaining freedom, freedom from strictures of class, gender, racism, and history, and art-specific subjects and aesthetic movements. Combined, all of these variables have contributed to the global development of the market interests in black visual culture. So with all of that, let's, what do you do? How do you start collecting? Um, you know, collecting is a basic part of the human personality. Many people think that it's a full-time affair, that you have to have a great deal of money, that you have to be an expert. And, um, but that's not true. Many of us have started um, collecting Stamps, coins, dolls, matchbook cars, <laughs> books, um, depending on when you were born, records, and records are coming back in style now. You can now start collecting records again. Um, and we've done this without much advice or training. And, you know, <laughs> and I think it's important that um, we look at the, the opportunity to take an interest in something. Um, as a, as a means of developing an aspect of ourselves. When I think about collecting and artists, I often reflect upon the ancient Mayans, the Aztecs, Pharaonic Egypt, and the lost city of Pompeii. Because the only thing that's left to tell us anything about these people, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, their successes, their challenges, is the art and technology that they have left behind. And the artists then, as the artists now, are representing the visual conscience of the time in which they live. They're making art for themselves and strangers, but they're also inviting us to consider things from different perspectives that we might not have considered before or even had an opportunity to pause to think about. But seeing that piece of work right up, <laughs> up close and personal stops you and it engages you. Um, so what are some of the steps that you could take towards collecting? The first thing is to, is to get books on the history of African American art, world art, contemporary art, indigenous, world, indigenous art worldwide, Western art, Asian and Southeast Asian art, the history of photography, the history of African American art, the, Contemporary, history of contemporary African artists. Why? Because the artists who are in art programs and the artists who are not, invariably they are all reading and looking at work and, and, and processing different ideas. Um, and they're looking at all of these things. This is important for you as a collector because if you're reading critical reviews, the, the references that are made in the critical reviews, you too will have a reference when they're talking about um, what an artist is doing and where, what their influences are. 
So it's important to get the books. Um, I'm going to give advice, something that used to drive my mother crazy, um, and that is just open the book, look at the pictures first, okay? <laughs> and just open the book. You don't have to start from the beginning. Just open the book and start where you're interested because where you're interested is gonna leave, lead you, even if it's a circuitous path, to reading the whole book anyway. But just start where you're interested in, or just start looking at the pictures because you're starting to develop your eye. The other thing is to subscribe to national, international um, art publications, um, dig digital, digital or paper publications. There's Art News, there's Art in America, there's the International Art Newspaper, there's Hyperallergic, um, there's Art, art Tactic Online, there's a whole bunch of publications. Just start reading. Um, and as you're reading, um, force yourself to think critically. It's okay, you know, unfortunately, um, we're in a, a, a society that has a, uh, that's become a very herd mentality society. It's really unfortunate. You do not have to agree. It's okay to have a different opinion. Just, you know, when you're having a discourse, substantiate your opinion. It can't be, I mean, I, I think all of us when we were kids, you know, you'd say, you can't just say, well, just because, you know. Only parents can say that to their kids, but <laughs> it's because I said so. But no, you can't just say just because. Um, you, you should think about it, and, and you'll have references from more things that you read, and you'll start to develop uh, an affinity for certain writers um, based on um, your perspective about art. Visit museums and galleries so that you can be exposed to diverse styles and historical periods and aesthetic techniques. Museums and galleries are wonderful places to just meander and it's also a great place and probably the only place that you'll have a chance to go to and talk to yourself out loud and nobody's going to take you to an institution. It's okay. You could look at the stuff, you can like it, you can dislike it, you can move about. <laughs> Um, it, it's, 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 it's a very um, special kind of a place, but you want to take advantage of seeing work in the way it's displayed because at the same time you're teaching yourself about framing. You'll start to become uh, aware of the different ways that work is presented, how it's framed, so that as you're collecting, you're starting to develop a library in your mind of what kinds of frames go with certain styles or periods of work, so that when you go to a frame shop, and if you've been to one, there's like a, a thousand or more L-shaped frame samples, but if you have an idea already, you will know from going to museums and galleries. Um, it's also important to be mindful of how the work is displayed in the context of if you see a piece of work in a historic home over a fireplace, that fireplace is not working. That does not mean take the, your painting and display it over a working fireplace. Um, you don't want to put paint, paint, oil paintings in environments with, or, or any art where there's great temperature fluctuations because the molecular structure of oil paint is naturally curly. So that's what happens when it when it's cracks, it's because it's going back to its natural state when there are temperature fluctuations. So be mindful of that when you are seeing work displayed in certain places. Um, you know, and you can also, um, I often encourage collectors to rotate their collections in their homes so that, because the light in the homes, you know, there's a cycle in the way that light hits the walls. And if you rotate the collections in the homes, it, it, it helps to preserve the, the, the work, the materials that the work is made of. These lights are, have UV, you know, UV rays. They will affect artwork too. You can get certain kinds of glass for work that needs to be um, behind glass. But it's minimal. But that's why it's good to rotate it. You really want to make time to look at art. And this is, again, where you can talk to yourself or somebody that's with you. Do I like this? Do I not like it? What do I like about it? What don't I like about it? And it's good if you like it strongly or you don't like it strongly. If you have absolutely no feeling, you have flatlined when you see this piece of work, the artist was not successful in evoking any emotion in you. Even if you hate the work, the artist did their job. It's okay. You don't like it. but. 
they did their job. The one that you have no feeling about, that's a problem, usually. Um, but you want to know what you like. Do you like landscapes? Do you like abstract work? Do you like figurative work? Do you like representational work? Do you like collage? Do you like mixed media? Do you prefer sculptures over prints? All of these things come about from looking at work at museums and galleries, looking at work in books, reading. Um, and all of this is a part of collecting and has nothing to do with the market, has everything to do with developing a passion within yourself and discovering new things about yourself through the ideas. It's not just what the pictures are, but what is the idea behind it? What is the artist communicating with you? Oh, you discovered something new. You had no awareness of something that was happening on the other side of the world based on what the, art, the piece of art is. This is what this dialogue, this discourse is between the artist and the collector. And it's a very personal um, communication. And the best part about it is that your collection is going to be as unique as you are, as unique as your fingerprints. And that's something, too, that collectors need to embrace and celebrate and not follow the herd mentality just because somebody says, well, you better jump on the bandwagon because this is going to be the next hottest artist. Only buy it if you like it. <laughs> Only buy it unless you're buying for purely investment purposes. But be clear about that for yourself. And um, the next thing is you want to start to get a feeling for the... Um, the people that you're working with. I always encourage collectors to work with more than one dealer. Why? Because the, universe, the art world and the universe is according to the aesthetic sensibility and interests of the dealer. That's their passion. That's what, they're, that's what they're selling and they're promoting. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the other reason why it's important to work with more than one dealer is that it doesn't mean that if you're traveling and you have a, tr a really trustworthy relationship with the dealer and you're traveling across the country um, and you see a piece of work in another gallery, but you're not really sure about the dealer. You might feel uncomfortable for some reason, but you love the work. Contact the dealer that you normally work with, and they will contact that dealer on your behalf. It does not mean that you're going to end up paying double or triple because your dealer is involved in that process. It does not mean that. The market it can only go but so far when you're buying in, in that context. But what it does is it also starts to um, enable you to become exposed to many more opportunities for work that working with one dealer would not enable you to, ha to have access to. Uh, so this, you know, this is a, a way of building the collection that's your collection um, instead of the collection um, of your dealer. Um, and then, of course, um, you want to... Um, become comfortable <laughs> with the you know with whatever the investment is for new collectors it's 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 a very it's a very traumatic thing to put even a thousand dollars on something or fifteen hundred dollars on something um, and um, and there are plenty of young and emerging artists uh, that you can begin collecting who are students and um, and also, you know, just artists who are who are just selling their work at, at fairs, as you know, not just galleries. And now, in in this century, many of the artists um, have decided that, in as much as they want to participate in this more traditional infrastructure, many of them are utilizing Instagram as a primary marketing tool. And collectors are discovering artists on Instagram, buying them, and then engaging them and bringing them into the more traditional infrastructure. So you have an opportunity to discover artists on your own through Instagram. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's safer in that way to find artists. Um, my personal um, uh, sort of pet peeve about Instagram is that um, it's, the, it's the perfect epitome of Descartes' cogito, I think I am. I, th therefore I, I think, therefore, I am. Meaning that you can say that you're anything on Instagram, but there's no vetting whatsoever. You could be, you can, whatever you want to be, you can be it on Instagram. But with the visual artists, you know, you can tell by their feed that this is their work. And so it's a, it's, it's a fairly safe place um, 
uh, to look for new artists. Um, I will give you a word of caution, though, that if you start using the internet, there will be occasions where somebody will send you an email say, think, acting as if you're an artist and asking you to um, make something for them. And that happens to be a scam. Um, to make your collection um, meaningful to you, and also if you ever think in your estate planning or at any point that you're going to deaccession your collection, it's really good to create a theme in your collection because the theme of your collection could very well be the gap in an institutional collection, which therefore makes it more valuable to the institution to acquire that collection because you have developed the expertise that the museum cannot afford to develop um, because of staffing and, and other kinds of expenses that are related to it. So make sure that your collection has some sort of theme. It could be um, artists from the 1930s, uh, women artists, abstract artists, figurative artists, artists who specifically worked in Fairfield, Connecticut um, in, in the 1920s. It could be anything. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that you have to stick to one thing. You should always just collect what you like. Um, So, I think the most important thing, I mean, I did talk about the dealers earlier. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to really have fun, you know, and discover that a real education is one in which you use your reading and research and critical thinking to experience new things about yourself and the world through art. So I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank the people who were viewing through the stream, and I welcome uh, questions, and I'll try to answer some. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? kind of oh, is put into a separate um, type of category than when we're talking about African-American art, <clears throat> and that's first part. And then second, do you think that they are at all suffering kind of the delegitimization that African-American artists were, um, and now that African-American artists kind of has its kind of trend and its mm -hmm. role going, <clears throat> is Africa and its artists playing catch up uh, to African-American artists? Okay, that's a very good question. I don't know if everyone heard it. So the first part of the question, if I heard it correctly, um, was had to do with that there are a lot more um, illustrator, a lot, of, a lot more artists from Africa who are illustrators and graphic artists who are mor mor morphing into the fine art arena. And you wanted to know what the impact of that was? So let me, let me rephrase yeah. it. It wasn't so much that there were illustrators, like commercial illustrators, but there, there are people who are doing lots of young uh, uh, artists who are doing pencil drawings, mm -hmm. right. um, charcoal drawings, really beautiful, uh, particularly photorealistic mm -hmm. um, arts. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, it, do you think in the, in the industry that is lumped into something separate and apart from African American art, is that like African art? And if so, do you think because of that, are they suffering a, trying okay. to play catch up much in the way that African American art was trying to play catch up? Okay. Uh, so I don't think that they're suffering. I think that with the fairly recent move to, for figurative work in the United States, that is what ironically, collectors are looking for. They want to see figurative works of black people and by black artists, which was the very antithesis of what collectors wanted because the perception was, well, black artists are only going to make portraits and paintings of themselves. So now we're in a time in the market where portraiture um, and painting and using Conti pencil and charcoal and everything um, is, is of great interest. 
I will say that the skill set of the African artists and the inventiveness and the creativity and the intellectual freedom of African artists has surpassed African American artists. And a lot of that has to do with the post-colonial conditioned responses to value, beauty, um, uh, and, and, uh, and trying to um, stay the course in a, an American culture that has, um, and where pe in, a, in, a, in a culture where erasure has been a part of the African American psyche from the moment that they're born. You're, you're, they're in, they're, you're not valid. And you have um, uh, epigenetic trauma as a result of that. And these are real things that over many decades and, and centuries, it, it's still a part of the psyche. So, you know, there's a, there's a um, and, and then there are artists who are able to push through that. A lot of the African artists, um, you know, they, um, you know, they, a, a lot of them come out of a tradition and history in their countries, even though they were colonized, they historically colonized, but they still had their names and their families and their cultural traditions and, and were able to hold on to certain aesthetic sensibilities that did not have to be muted in any, any way. And also a lot of the artists, um, um, the distractions are very different. I mean, uh, I mean, these are very sophisticated communities and cities and even rural areas where even though it's simple, there are very complex thought, pro uh, thought patterns because of also the complexity of the religious life that's on the continent. That's an integral part that's very different than the way that the um, black church has functioned historically because of the history in America. It's significant, but it's different. Are African artists um, behind in the market? Um, I think that the, what, what happened is that the, there's a parallel now with the middle and upper middle class and wealthy collectors in Africa to the middle class um, and the upper middle class people in the United States who were collecting African American art in the 80s. So this is just happening now in Africa, whereas it was happening in the 80s. So in a lot of ways, the market that was developing for American artists of African descent has helped the African market because there's already an appetite for African diasporic visual culture and art. And with that appetite, there's um, a greater um, openness to different mediums that may not have been considered before. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm so glad because it was for you. <laughs> well, that, that's the, that's the a, good, a good speaker always makes it feel like it is for you. Right? Uh, when you talk about themes and, and, you, and you start to talk about collecting in terms of themes, and you went into more of like time periods and, 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 and that kind of thing, or maybe the particular artists, and I guess as I looked at, I thought about the things I've collected so far, the theme is more around content, I think. I think you know, if I look at what's the underlying thing, the theme is going on and what I mm -hmm. collect, it's around women and, and, and strong women in different kinds of environments, I guess is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a variety of different kinds of media. And I was wondering, so is that, is that a disadvantage or do you, do you consider that to be a theme when, when it's more kind of content driven versus a type of art or, or period or that your artist. collection is extremely significant because you purchased what you like and what you like and there's a subliminal natural um, affinity that starts to happen when you start collecting work because when you, you'll notice it when you start to hang it in your home and the way you position different pieces and you'll start to see the themes as you hang it so as you said you have diverse mediums, um, you had an interest in women artists, but there's a certain theme. And there are certain themes that are gender-based in the experience of being female, right? Um, that s some of those sensibilities may come through in the work. Then there are other things that have nothing to do with that and it's pure aesthetic. So you have a theme, um, but it doesn't, it, it's, it's, I don't know if you were thinking that because I said, okay, it's just, 
you know, uh, works on paper, that that made it more valuable. No, it doesn't. But I would say this, that if you were ever donating your collection or trying to sell the collection, chances are you have pieces in it that are more valuable than others. And to be able to get the most in that um, donation uh, as a tax write-off or the most in the sale, you want to keep the entire collection together. Because if you sell the most valuable pieces off first and you're left with pieces that people are not interested in collecting, it will be harder to move those pieces. And that's why uh, you want to keep the collection together when you donate it, because you might also be exposing an institution or another collector to an artist that may be lesser known, but has you know becomes a catalyst for them to go on a whole new journey about somebody that is significant. Um, thank you so much. I really especially appreciated the, the slide with the explanation on the art market. I hadn't seen that done that way, and that was just so brilliant. Um, my question is about um, around the idea of um, subject being about African Americans themselves is really trendy right now. Yeah. And I'm wondering in the marketplace if you could speak a little bit to what this means for abstract expressionists um, and other artists that are black but are working not where the subject is overtly about black culture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is trendy, um, but the thing about trends is that they are cyclical. Um, you know, when abstract expressionism was at its uh, peak, um, you know, artists like Benny Andrews and Faith Rengold continued to do their work, figurative work. Um, and so I think that um, it's trendy for the people who have jumped on the bandwagon and who are late to the party. It is not trendy you know, to people who have been collecting uh, for decades, or it is not trendy to people who are following what they think and feel. And, um, you know, I mean, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the, the things that I find so um, disturbing and why I wanted to try to talk about this in the way that I did, because when you read a lot of the articles, in the, in the magazines, in the newspapers, it's like, oh my gosh, a meteor just fell, and you know, black artists, oh my goodness, and they can paint, and they can walk and talk, and they can think, and <laughs> and where did they come from? You know, it's like they came from Mars, and these artists have been here, um, you know, for a very, very long time, making great work, and. Um, and uh, the articles don't talk about that. You know, they, they have written things like, well, where are the black art dealers? Well, the black art dealers have been here, been there all along. I mean, coming into this century, there were actually 45 black owned galleries, you know? Um, but, you know, to, to go by just what's in the media, you know, is, is, is very challenging for people who are interested, interested sincerely, didn't know because they didn't read about any of these artists in the history books when they were in school. Nobody was talking about it. And now all of a sudden, boom. And, you know, and then there are those because of the challenges that we have in the social political climate of the country that think it's, oh, it's just about black people and it's, and it's about black lives. And, and then they turn it into something else, you know. And so I would say that, um, uh, art is about ideas, and it reflects the experiences and the lives um, and the interests of all cultural producers uh, of any background. And um, white American artists are challenged by the figure, too. You have a whole bunch of abstract expressionists, you know, of European descent who are also being challenged because of, of, of the figure. Or, um, you know, uh, artists who um, are not, you know, a lot of the um, mid-career artists or the older artists are getting more of the attention than some of the emerging artists. It's, it, it just continues to fluctuate, you know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it or think about it more than just as a collector to look at and buy what you like. Um, I think that, I will say that the trend is very um, dangerous not for the collectors, but for the artists. 
because a lot of these artists now are hot and happening and they are in demand and, um, and they are having to produce work at a velocity that is unnatural to the creative process. And there are certain artists that are, you know, getting a lot of attention. Um, and when I, you know, when I was traveling before COVID around the world to different art fairs as a part of research for this next book that I'm working on, canvases were coming to the fair wet, still wet. Or, you know, when you look at um, screen prints and to tell whether or not a screen print is a quality screen print, you have to make sure the registration is correct, right? So that means that if you're doing a silk screen and just think about a stencil for people that aren't familiar with it, um, the colors have to meet exactly. So if this is red and this is blue, when the t and this is a head and this is a shirt or something, the colors have to meet exactly. Sh you shouldn't see any white paper or line between where the colors meet. Well, when you paint, in this case, this artist, there was her painting, and you could see all these white spots, and it was a large painting. So the time to step back and look forward and go back and forth, I mean, you know, when you write, you know, how many drafts do you read and rewrite and rewrite? It's the same thing. They don't have that time. So I'm speaking from a perspective now as an appraiser where that piece of work is at a fair. They're charging $250,000, asking $250,000 for it. Um, and then I see another piece that's of a better quality that's sold at auction for $100,000, and that's a better painting what happens in the market and it's going to affect these artists without them realizing it and they ha and a lot of these artists are so happy that they're getting attention they don't realize how much power they have where they can say that's it i'm only doing x number of paintings a year i mean they're in that kind of position the old gallery system was different where the dealers would say okay here's a hundred thousand dollars you have a year to work you produce the work that's it and then you know they sort out the rest. It's different now. The, and so it, they're hurt, a lot of them are hurting themselves because um, they're working too quickly. They're not creating boundaries. The other thing uh, is that they are enslaved in a different way and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. Um, and uh, you know, so you know, that's a concern um, that I have. The other concern now in the market has to do with how younger artists are not really visiting each other's studios and talking about their work and aesthetic movements. Will there ever be another aesthetic movement you know, among African American artists because they're afraid somebody's gonna take a photograph of their work and then it's gonna get copied and then my question always is, is that the only idea you have? If it is, then you need to do something else. <laughs> but you know, so there's a lot of different things that are happening um, that are that are not necessarily good for the artists, but it's it's um, and the other thing is that dealers um, are also inhibiting the development of many of these artists because they because they want them to keep making what sells. And anybody that knows artists that you know and the way an artist's mind functions, you know the brain. It's you know the way that cerebral hemispheric asymmetry works in terms of left right brain function the divergent thought process of exploring the endless possibilities of an idea, a medium, um, or a concept is a part of art making. And if you're stuck on a treadmill of what's selling, they're killing the artists at the same time. I think we need to leave it there. Thank you so much, thank Alima. You. This was fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank it's you. A pleasure. For, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>